to see the traffic study. All right, it's seven o'clock. I'm going to call the meeting to order. A meeting of the Planning and Economic Development Committee was held today, June 14th, at 7 p.m. in the automatic chamber. Will the clerk please call the roll? Um, Alderman at Large, Melbourne Moran Jr. I'm here. Um, Alderman at Large, Michael o B. O'Brien Sr. Present. Alderman June M. Karen. Alderman at Large, Ben Clemens. Here. And Alderman Derek Tebow is here. We also have in attendance Alderman Rick Dowd. Uh, Economic Development Director Liz Hannum and Planning Director Matt Sullivan. Uh, does the rule, does the uh, public here have to have a quorum of the Board of Aldermen or just the no. PEDC? Just, just, just for this, for the PEDC. All right. And uh, Alder, Alderman Karen informed me that she was um, out today because she's not feeling too well. All right. So uh, before we open the public hearing for public comment, um, Director Sullivan, I believe you have a presentation for us. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Here? Chair, for the record. Oh, yeah. um, this, the, it, this is for 023-055, amending the zoning map by rezoning land off along the, the Amherst Street corridor from general business to general business with mixed use overlay district for, uh, from park industrial to park industrial with mixed use overlay district and from highway business to highway business with mixed use overlay district. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the record. Matt Sullivan, Community Development Director for the City of Nashua. Uh, I will be brief with my remarks this evening. For those that may remember, back on, uh, I believe it was October 22nd of 2022, uh, Planning Manager Sam Durfee and I gave a far lengthier presentation on really two specific areas in the city. Uh, that were potential candidates for uh, a mixed-use overlay rezoning, uh, those being the Amherst Street Corridor and the Daniel Webster Highway Corridor. Uh, as a result of that presentation back in October, uh, I think it was clear as a consensus of this committee that we were not going to proceed with the Daniel Webster Corridor rezoning, but were in fact going to proceed with a mixed-use overlay rezoning along the Amherst Street Corridor. What I won't do tonight is talk about in detail the Imagine Nashua Master Plan, the existing conditions. I think we covered that in great detail back at that October meeting. But I'll just briefly talk about what the mixed use overlay is, its rough basis in the Imagine Nashua Master Plan, what the extent of the rezoning will be, and then of course answer any questions that, that you have that might aid in your decision this evening. Uh, what I will represent though is that the Planning Board unanimously recommended this at its last Planning Board meeting. And I think there was a fair level of cons consensus from the aldermen as well that this was a good idea to move forward, as evidenced by the number of sponsors presented before you. And so before I get into the detail uh, of the proposed rezoning itself, just to take a step back, and I, I apologize for the visuals being a bit small, but I wanted to set some context uh, within the Imagine Nashua 2021 master plan that was completed for the city of Nashua. If you do remember, there were several sort of priority redevelopment or focus areas that were included within that plan. Uh, for particularly rezoning as part of the city's comprehensive land use code update, which I'm happy to give a, an update on later in the meeting tonight, perhaps. But these areas were all identified for potential rezoning. Uh, each one has a different set of priorities and objectives, uh, but certainly Daniel Webster Corridor and again, the Amherst Street Corridor were identified as areas where there was a need to introduce a more flexible form of zoning that would produce uh, a more predictable from a form perspective, but a less predictable from a use perspective, uh, at least vision moving forward. And so if you're not familiar right now, uh, I guess I'll just cover briefly a little more in depth. Uh, some of the recommendations related specifically to this were the, the increase of height and density along the corridor, much of which is currently commercially zoned with very limited residential permitted uses, and really encouraging land uses that would uh, be really more comprehensive redevelopments of the property along the corridor. One of the things I'll point out is this graphic down in the lower right-hand side. Uh, if you orient yourself, obviously this is the Amherst Street Corridor right in the middle here. There's an idea of building a much more active street front <coughs> along the length of the corridor from uh, really, I would say, uh, really the full length up to really the, the Everett Turnpike. Here we're prioritizing a portion of that, of that area, but this cross section is what was envisioned for the properties along the corridor. So again, a vertical development up at the street frontage limited parking areas behind that would be shared then with some of the more uh, institutional office space and other uses that we see to the rear of these properties right now, recognizing there's a very uh, a diverse mix of uses along the corridor right now uh, in those commercial categories. 
But again, the idea was to adjust the dimensional constraints and produce a more predictable product from a, from a look and feel perspective while being more flexible when it comes to use. And so I want to be really clear before I get into the re recommendation itself that we do anticipate that this will be opened up for a discussion as part of that comprehensive land use recodification. But this mixed use overlay proposal that's before you this evening is a bit of a band-aid or a pilot, if you will, to see by installing this more uh, flexible zoning whether it in fact incentivizes redevelopment of some of the properties <coughs> along the corridor that might be ripe for redevelopment. So that's really why we're moving forward with this tonight, with the basis being the imagined national plan. To give a sense of what exists out there today, and I know this is a bit hard to see, but I'll try to quickly walk you through this. Uh, Amherst Street itself runs right here to the north of Round Pond, all the way down to Somerset Parkway, uh, with some sort of interesting uh, planned residential development back in the residential areas and then all the way down here towards the Everett Turnpike, which is down in this area. It's a mix of zoning today. There's a mixture of highway business, general business, park industrial, and then some sprinkling of higher density to medium density residential set back from the Amherst Street corridor as well. But generally the parcels fronting on Amherst Street proper are commercially zoned with limited residential allowances for permitted uses. And so if somebody wanted to come in and do a vertical redevelopment that had a mixed use a component to it, it would not be allowed by right today. It would be something that would require a variance from the Zoning Board of Adjustment, which is, a, as we know, a very high bar to attain. Thus, the proposal is to install a, a component of existing zoning that we've implemented throughout the city, and this is the mixed-use overlay district. I would argue it's our most flexible overlay in the city. It essentially <coughs> passes the traditional zoning relief powers granted to the Zoning Board onto the planning board as part of the site plan review process. And so what that means is that uh, a developer or an applicant is required to meet a set of criteria that are generally uh, use compatibility, character-based, public safety, and uh, general welfare standards. And if they meet those criteria, although the use may not be allowed by the underlying zoning, the planning board can actually grant them use relief to put that use or to allow that use where it would not otherwise be permitted. Uh, but again, there are controls in place. There are uh, a set of standards that the board has to consider. The applicant has to present a site plan suitability report. And so I, well, I want to recognize that, or, or at least convey that this is a flexible zone. I want to also be clear that there are still design standards, there, sorry, there are still zoning standards in place. There are still criteria that need to be met. And all of the site plan regulations that customarily apply to an application would still apply to the proposal here. So we're not getting rid of all the regulation. We're simply ma making the planning board more nimble in allowing other uses along the corridor by installing this mixed use overlay. So let's get to the real, I, I think the meat and potatoes of this. And again, I, I <coughs> have this figure within your packets, so I apologize for having the small version up here. Uh, but we've taken the committee's advice back for, at that October meeting and recommended an extent of MU overlay that goes all the way up to the Market Basket Plaza and really uh, sort of Northwest Boulevard here, extends back to the rear of the properties that are currently zoned highway business and uh, general business, and then extends all the way down really to, I'm gonna use this property as an identifier, but uh, the Law family uh, company and the properties that they own adjacent to Sharon Avenue. That's really where we've extended this to on the southern side of the border. Now, if I'm this committee and I look at this, I think that's a very small area to be rezoned. What's important to understand is that if we were to draw a larger rectangle along this entire area of the corridor that maybe we wanted to rezone as mixed use, a substantial part of that area is already zoned MU overlay. And so this step has already been taken in some portions of the corridor. That's why this action before you this evening is only these remaining red areas. And so if approved, this mixed use overlay would cover really a, a massive, a massive area along the Amherst Street corridor, filling in the gaps created by prior rezonings uh, of the area. So this is the this is the request before you this evening to install the mixed use overlay district along the Amherst Street corridor to the extent represented here. Again, this really is just a key that potentially unlocks future development or redevelopment opportunity. It's incumbent upon the development community to actually express an interest in in doing mixed use development in this area. But I, as I represented before, uh, we have seen real developer interest in doing mixed use here. And we've actually had folks come in with the visuals from the Imagine Nashua Master Plan and ask, how do I do this? And unfortunately to date, we've had to say, 
you can't do it just yet uh, because we don't have the zoning in place. This would allow us to move that conversation forward. And so although this is a band-aid as I've represented and it's temporary in nature and sort of a pilot, I believe that it is very possible that this sort of year to a year and a half solution could yield some real results when it comes to mixed use development along the corridor. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee has or uh, if the public has any comments as well. Uh, should we do the hearing first and then open up the questions at the actual committee? Well, if you have clarifying questions, I have a clarifying question. Clarifying question. So on, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So on this map right here, where it goes north or west or however we want to, no. Oh, you sorry, have, sorry, no, yeah. I didn't mean to move that, yep. Yep, so all the way to the west there. Now you said it incorporates Market Basket. Is that yes. very corner, the uh, uh, whatever is southern New Hampshire? This, yeah, great, great question. And is that Greystone Plaza in the front, so it doesn't go right so, to the edge of Nashua and Merrimack? Yeah, great, great question. So no, uh, it actually does not include the uses across Northwest Boulevard. So it really, it rides the center line of Northwest Boulevard all the way to the intersection with the CSX rail line, the CSX rail uh, right of way to the south. And then on the northern end, if I were writing a zoning description, I'd say to the thread of the brook up there in the water. That's sort of where it runs to on the northern end. That's the extent of it. So the road that basically goes to Market Basket, nothing on the other side of it. That's correct. And wraps around, it gets the Westwood Y and that whole section behind yep. Market Basket. Yes, and, okay. and the reason for excluding the, the western side of Northwest Boulevard uh, is really that a lot of that is very environmentally constrained. And so development opportunity is very limited there. And so, um, you know, you could argue that even this area should not be rezoned, but I didn't feel it was necessary nor prudent to rezone that western side based on the environmental constraints that are in place. To be clear, I think that could happen in the future, uh, but, you know, we do need to be sensitive in this area. You know, these, these water bodies here are a drinking water source for not only Nashua, but other surrounding communities. And so, um, you know, we want development that's conscientious. And so I do want to be very careful when, you know, allowing high density residential use adjacent to the water. Great. Thank you. Of course. All right. So I'll open it up for um, public testimony. I'm, I'm pretty sure the... Uh, the rain's keeping people away. Yeah. Because this is riveting stuff. Um, testimony in favor? None. Opposition? None. Again, in favor? None. And opposition? All right, so I'll close the public hearing at 7.13 p.m. 7.12 p.m., I'm sorry. All right, so at uh, 7... 12 p.m. We'll reopen the uh, we'll open the regular meeting. Can you recall the the, the roll? Yeah. Uh, Alderman at Large Melbourne Moran Jr. Here. Alderman at Large Michael B. O'Brien Sr. Present. Alderman June M. Karen is out. Uh, Alderman at Large Ben Clemens. Here. Alderman Derek Tebow is here. We also have Alderman uh, Richard Dowd, uh, Exe uh, Economic Development Director Liz Hannum, and Planning Director Matt Sullivan. All right. Um, I know we have you on uh, at the front of the uh, agenda for um, discussion on outside dining, but I think I'll change it up just a bit so Director Sullivan can finish what he's started, and that way we don't have to hold him back, if that's all right with the, the remainder of the committee. Any objection? Yeah, all, right. Public comment all right. All right. Yeah. So uh, any public comment? Don't see any. So we'll postpone the discussion and uh, communications. Um, we have communications from Planning Director Sam Durfee, uh, referral from the Board of Aldermen on proposed ordinance 0-23-055, amending the zoning map by rezoning land off along the Emerald Street Corridor from general business to general business with mixed-use overlay district, from park industrial to park industrial with mixed-use overlay district, and, then, and from highway business to highway business with mixed use overlay district. Right. There being no objection, I'll accept this communication and place it on file. Unfinished business? There is none. Uh, new business resolutions? There is none. New business ordinances? Uh, I'd like to make a motion uh, for final passage um, for 0-23-055, uh, uh, amending the zoning map by rezoning land off along the Amherst Street corridor from general business to general business with mixed Use overlay district from park industrial to park industrial with mixed use overlay district and from highway business to highway business with mixed use overlay district. That is a mouthful. Any discussion on the motion? 
Alderman Dowd. Now, would it be possible before the full board of Alderman meeting, although it might be tight, uh, to get the a map with all of the zoning that's going to remain after this is approved from the railroad tracks to the first 200 feet on the on the north side of Amherst Street, so we know which zonings are not being impacted. Um, the other is um, Mike, Michael Buckley's uh, mm -hmm. taking over the Sanu property mm -hmm. to develop a new restaurant. Is that set with zoning? Director Sullivan. Uh, yes, Alderman Dowd. Uh, to answer your question, yes, we actually intend to produce two graphics uh, in advance of the aldermanic hearing. Uh, one will be a final rezoning map. Uh, this map that we've included within the packet is not necessarily to the standard that we would include with the final uh, package. It doesn't require amendment of, of the zoning that's before you in any way, but we'll produce a more, uh, I'll use the term professional version that shows the full extent of the proposed zoning. But I can also have prepared what would essentially be uh, a, an existing zoning map with the, all of the underlying zoning the existing extent of the mixed use overlay as it is today mm -hmm. with a, a, a different color or hatching and then a proposed extent of the MU overlay as it would exist should the ordinance be approved. We can absolutely produce that in advance of the hearing. Okay. And, and uh, to Mr. Buckley's property, uh, yes, that, that, uh, that project is fully approved. Uh, and so this rezoning would not impact that proposal in any way, shape or form. I assume you're referring to, I believe it's 420 Amherst Street uh, no, I'm sorry, not 420. Right near Round Pond. Yeah, I, I do know what you mean. That's not the right address, though. But yes, that was fully approved. Okay. So, um, follow up? Yes. Fully approve of, of this. And uh, as soon as it passes, I will probably step out because I'm not a member of this committee and I'm fine with downtown dining. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Dow. Just eight We can definitely have you join <laughs> at some point. <laughs> Uh, Alderman Tebow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I approve of this too. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing the, you know, the whole plan as it goes forward because I think it's uh, it's needed. Um, you referred to it in your opening comments, and um, I just need a, re a reminder or a refresher on it. Why did we we push off the Daniel Webster uh, corridor for now? Yeah, great question. Uh, the reason that we pushed off the Daniel Webster corridor is that. Uh, the properties that are not currently mixed use zoned are very limited along the Daniel, uh, the Daniel Webster corridor and very few of those could actually be feasibly redeveloped based on the existing uses that are there. That's not to say we shouldn't install zoning to be, you know, future oriented and look towards a development opportunity, but the areas were simply much smaller than we thought they were. Um, whereas this is actually, although it's a partial area, it's actually a fairly significant portion of the corridor. The zoning along the Daniel Webster corridor is incredibly flexible as it is today. There are very few parcels that are not actually under a very flexible zoning. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman O'Brien. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support this also, but if I uh, threw you to uh, Director Sullivan, um, past history on the fire department, I've had situations where there's been car accidents, one housing development, the painter threw paint down the uh, storm drains, and, and I'm sure that you know that the storm drains and to the people of the city, if you happen to see a fish on the curbstone of the storm drain, it means it goes to the you know, public water supply. Mm -hmm. So on Amherst Street, every single storm drain is going right to Penichuk Pond, something that we're gonna have future in drinking. So as we look at this, yeah. can we do better stewardship in protecting the, uh, the drinking quality? That's, Mr. Sure Chair, so. that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, one of the great things about redevelopment is not just that it's redevelopment and we get new shiny things, but it's also that redevelopment gives the city an opportunity to take sites that maybe were not developed in the most responsible way or in a compliant way with our current rules and regulations. And it gives us the ability to sort of, it gives us a redo, if you will. Um, and we have very good stormwater regulations in place that the engineering department is the steward of that requires limitations on offsite uh, discharge. 
and our level of treatment as well. And so the more redevelopment that we see along the corridor, the more opportunity we have to actually remedy environmental issues that may have been created in the past. And so, uh, you know, I'm not just saying that to say it, truly more redevelopment is better opportunity to be better environmental stewards. So yes, I think this rezoning opportunity, although development oriented, has very positive impacts on envir or environmental uh, health as well. Mm -hmm. uh, follow up, if I may. I mean, case in point, what I'm talking, I would much rather have the uh, Hostess Corporation with their Hostess Cupcakes uh, <laughs> liquidation sale, my wife will kill me for saying that, <laughs> then compared to having a gas station with potential uh, gas tank leak at yeah. some point, possibly at yeah. some point. So this is what I'm saying. This might be a better time to look and evaluate this. What is the occupancy? I mean, the building's a building, but the occupancy of the building will or can affect this. Yeah. Director Sullivan. And just a, a follow-up comment to, you know, two things I don't want to lose sight of. It, one being that, you know, as part of the New Hampshire DOT's 10-year plan, there is a project to, uh, it was initially intended to be a widening of Amherst Street, but, but the priorities have changed. And so what's really being discussed now is more of a, a, a traffic calming, but lane maintenance plan with pedestrian and bicycle facilities along the length of the corridor. And the reason I bring that up is that there'll also be stormwater improvements most likely included in that to take some of the road runoff that doesn't necessarily get, isn't subject to our local rules and regulations and maybe install some additional treatment as well. So there's also, you know, there's gonna be improvements along the corridor from an environmental health perspective related to transportation too. Yeah. And one last follow-up. Follow yeah. uh, beautiful segue into my next question. And that is the state. Is the state going to yeah. get involved? You know, again, I support this, yep. but will the state get involved? Because it's always irked me in the city of Nashua, the state raises the plow and does not plow the snow. We take care of it. We take care of Amherst Street. But if you go into uh, Amherst, for example, yep. the state trucks drop the plow and plow the same section of state road, which that's another issue, I understand. But as a state representative and looking at it, it's not fair to an urban compact community such as Nashua. Yep. Your response Just to that? Yeah, the only response is yes, such is the such is the life of an urban compact community, all the constraint without any of the benefit. Um, and that's not a criticism of DOT. You know, there's a Oh, go for it. <laughs> well, you, you, can, you can, I can't. Uh, and, and they've been, you know, they, DOT has really changed their approach to a lot of projects. And so I just want to point out, in all seriousness, you know, lane widening used to be a huge priority. Moving cars as quickly as possible. Vehicles used to be the priority for NHDOT. When we approached them to potentially move this towards a more complete streets approach, they were completely on board. They have changed the way that they are looking at roadways. And so I give them credit. Now, we will need to engage NHDOT if we are going to do something like this right here. This is a major change that will require significant engagement and will be difficult to garner support from NHDOT because, as, again, as much as this will be our responsibility, you know, it's, it's their road. And so we're a long way from doing that. Um, I think the carriageway concept particularly is the, going to be the challenge. The development is, frankly, more realistic than the carriageway itself is. And so we'll be talking to DOT, but you know, it's going to be an incremental moving of the ball on some of these more lofty design standard goals. Thank you for taking my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Alderman Clemens and Alderman Dowd. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. In, in regards to that mm -hmm. picture up there and the traffic calming, not a good idea, in my, my opinion. One, you see places like Route 9 in Brookline that look very much like that, uh, in my opinion, they, they, they don't work. And secondly, it is the only major thoroughfare between Milford and Nashua. Yep. And it carries 100,000 people back and forth on any given weekend or any given day for that matter. So the, pro the idea of slowing down traffic on that corridor between the highway and Milford I, I, is not something that I think would be a good idea. Yeah, 
couple things. One thing to add to that is um, one time when I was having my tires changed, I'm sitting there and counting the trucks. And in two hours, there were about 300 trucks that went by. A lot of truck traffic on Amherst Street. Yep. Uh, the other thing is that all of the newest developments out there, when they changed hands, like especially the ones that made gas stations, they have taken efforts to make sure that their drainage from those lots does not go into the yep. ponds. Uh, they have different ways of doing it, uh, whether it's sloping things to take it towards Amherst Street or putting catch basins in that separate stuff. It's different things, but it doesn't get into the water supply anymore. So all the new gas stations, the new Shell station, there's, there's several new gas stations, and they all have been restricted as to their drainage. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You guys have opened up all kinds of questions for me. So um, just in some of the comments you guys have made, um, you know the you know, the calming of the traffic. So I mean, I, I've I've lived off Amherst Street. So Amherst Street, it's busy now and so i see the widening i go oh yeah that would help because it, it there's days i don't want to go up Amherst. i'm glad i don't have to anymore um you know my dad lives in south merrimack and i could go up Amherst street to get there go by market basket go by wendy's and it's not too far, far from penetrick square but i don't i take the highway and i go to exit 11 and i cut back the other way because i don't want any part of Amherst street but it would be nice to be able to want to be go to Amherst street because there is a lot of good things on Amherst street lots of good stores and lots of good places to go restaurants um, you know, I hope this doesn't, I hope this is going to help us not have every time something closes down, there's a, a bank or a gas station, because that's the stuff we're trying, I think, right. I mean, we have those everywhere now. Right. Um, so I hope that that helps that. I think it's going to, um, and, you know, my last point here and, and, you know, Alderman O'Brien kind of opened it up by mentioning fire. Um, again, if we're using calming tactics and we're in the future and and or we just make putting more th things on Amherst Street and there's more yep. traffic on Amherst Street yep. you know he's on Amherst Street now so there's gonna be tons, tons of traffic going to him right that's gonna make it tougher for fire trucks to get up and down Amherst Street right and so you know I know this is not your <laughs> purview but again the whole it's come up before new fire station needs yep. to be somewhere in this corridor to be able to cover this section especially if we're gonna you know put a lot more things here and have more traffic or whatnot we're going to need that so again not your issue it's more of the fire stations and fire department and our, our purview but but mr chair if i may yeah, to that point i think it, the last time i presented i was very honest about the fact that it can't be done in a vacuum there are going to be increasing fire demands there are going to be increasing sewer and water demands and so it's you know, if I had Dan Hudson sitting next to me, he'd be kicking me, and he knows about this, but you know, he, he's nervous about this kind of thing, and very rightfully so, and so the, there will be a need for infrastructure investment if the existing infrastructure is not adequate, and that goes for fire service provision as well, and so I don't, I don't want to seem like we're going forth without having those things in place, but there will be a moment where there needs to be a very real conversation about whether or not there does need to be a fire station in this area. Should development play the way out that Develop, play out the way that the master plan intends. Um, so we're putting the carpet before for the horse a little bit here, uh, but hopefully this brings us closer to discussions on those infrastructure needs that we have. Great, thank you. Alderman O'Brien. Uh, thank you, and, and Mr. Sullivan, you know that's a pending discussion that's been before this particular board. And I would appreciate it if you rehash it again when you make your full presentation to the Board of Aldermen, okay. because I think according to the Fire Department master plan, is solving by looking at that. And if you could have the numbers, uh, if you anticipate an increase in population, uh, whether it be transient or residential, with any of that, you know, compared to existing now, which will help us in making that decision of an additional uh, fire company. I'm happy, I'm happy to provide some components of what you're asking for, Alderman O'Brien. The only thing I, I really can't anticipate is potential build-out, if you will, of, of the full area. Um, unfortunately, one of the unpredictable components of the mixed-use overlay is because it's so flexible, you simply don't always know what you're going to get. Uh, but what I can do is I can, I can at least communicate with Chief Buxton and get a sense of what kind of the thresholds would be. Um, 
and so we know or have a sense of you know what level of development would really tip the scales along this corridor such that it would become a, a more dire need that maybe it already is to have additional fire service out here but um, I do want to say that we should be doing that building build out exercise in the future to understand what the, the service demands here will be. I expect that engineer Hudson will not let us proceed with some redevelopment proposals unless we have some of those numbers. Uh, I just don't have them today, unfortunately. Fair answer. Thank you. All of them in doubt and all of them in deal. And I've been working with Chief Buxton and others on um, the fire plan. By September of 24, will be done with schools, hopefully. And um, they, it's time to turn our attention to fire stations. And the, I was also involved in their master plan. And it calls for a fire station off Amherst Street. There's a lot uh, near National Community College on Thornton Road that's been set aside for a fire station. Uh, and there's also uh, a plot in Southern Nashua for a fire station. The, the problem is we have to plan way ahead for that because there's some initial thought about moving an existing company from Amherst Street because we're going to be having to repair that building. Otherwise, we're going to have an 80,000 pound trunk, truck that costs 1.3 million in a basement that can't go anywhere. Um, so we're going to be looking at fire stations in the next uh, two or three years. Mm -hmm. Um, they have to do some planning ahead, and um, they probably need to repair some existing fire stations first. Um, but um, they they will at some point have to be built. And but right now we've got issues with Amherst Street fire stations that need to be addressed. We have issues at the airport fire station that need to be addressed. And the problem we have right now is the airport fire station covers Amherst Street. But if there's an accident on Sharon Ave or at the intersection of Sharon and Amherst Street, forget it. There's no other way to get there. So they need something on the other side of Amherst Street, but they can't just close the airport fire station because that's Ward 1. So all that's being looked at, and it will probably be in near term, next two to five years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was up Amherst Street not too long ago, and I actually noticed, surprisingly, some, some buildings being done. And so I was just kind of curious. I saw one, I think, um, near that collision place, not too far from the Round Pond. Yeah. Um, and then there was one across, really, from the community college, I think, near Dumaine Street, or where that um, gas station is. It used to be a bank where it looked like a barn with a silo. Um, and there might be some other stuff I don't see. Do you know how roughly how many more residential uh, or people that are moving? Like, how, how? what are we thinking? Like, when we think of, like, the bronze scenes, we go 250, whatever. But yeah. how much do we think right now is new to Amherst Street as far as residential? Yeah, so there are, I believe, three active residential developments along Amherst Street right now. There's a development or that's recently completed at 8 Blackstone behind the Shell uh, in that location. There was a development done there. Uh, there was a development, there's a development underway on Dumaine Avenue for uh, 24 units, and I believe there's another development underway on Dumaine as well. So approximately 60 units have been introduced along the corridor, uh, but we've had inquiries on other properties as well that have just not moved forward at this point in time. I'm not saying zoning is the impediment necessarily, um, but I will say the Dumaine Avenue properties were the result of a rezoning of the Dumaine Avenue properties to MU overlay. So that actually directly facilitated them moving forward with the townhome development that was done there. But Alderman Tebow, it's about 60 right now that are underway along the corridor. I do think, you know, there was a huge development influx of all the apartment buildings that you see off to particularly the southern side yeah. and the northern side in some areas too. So Amherst Street is without question an attractive place to live based on the access and the amenities and the resources that are there. It's just, it, it, unless you're in a development, it's not really a community per se. And so I think the idea is to build some connections between those different separate communities along the corridor to create a more almost contiguous Amherst Street neighborhood. Well, also to Alderman Clemens' point, you know, this is a major, the major east-west thoroughfare in the city. And so we cannot ignore that. And so 
yes, you know, planners and, and urbanists like me can dream that we're going to go to a single lane in each direction. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a realist. I mean, I know that's not going to happen, but can we put those two to three lanes in a configuration that at least makes it feel a little more safe to navigate the corridor? I think the answer is yes. Great. Thank you. All right. No more questions or statements. Well, Director Sullivan, I just want to thank you for your work on this. You and uh, Sam, um, it was months. It started with <laughs> just me and Alderman Clemens yep. having a side conversation about how we can get more uh, building to happen for housing in the in the community. And then you turned it into this. And now the next step is to get developers up there. And I think that's great. Um, anything we can do to increase the, the options for housing in the city will be uh, a wonderful thing. Plus the mixed use. Uh, piece to add, you know, restaurants, business, all yeah. next to residential, all that, um, similar to an email that um, uh, Alderman Sullivan sent out with a, right. an article attachment for other towns yeah. that are using it. Um, all right. So without any further discussion, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. The ayes have it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Director Sullivan. I will I'll stay. All right. We'll go back to... Um, uh, the discussion. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Director. I appreciate it. Thank See you, you. Alderman Dow. Um, it's great to, to meet you. I've seen the um, the interview uh, videos and stuff oh, yeah. like that. I think it was awesome. All right. So um, so we're looking for uh, uh, conversation on downtown dining, um, just to start the conversation now before. Um, the next season approaches. And my yeah. initial thought to bringing this up was, how's it working? What's the feedback from the community? Is Mother's Day weekend working to the, I think it's Labor Day? No, October. Um, Columbus before, Day? I think it's yeah, right before, before Columbus Day. Yeah. And just getting feedback of how it's working for um, the restaurants and uh, if they're uh, okay with the fees. One of the thoughts I had about the fees is equi making them equitable. Um, and this is um, how I would describe that, and anyone else can always jump in and just talk about it. But I think, like someone who's grossing maybe a hundred thousand a year, shouldn't maybe even pay a fee, um, and maybe someone who's grossing two million should pay seven fifty. And then we have like a range based on how much they're they're grossing with, like a certification. They can say, hey, on my New Hampshire business taxes, I. I gross X amount from this range, and then we can set a fee, an equitable fee, so smaller restaurants yeah. aren't kneecapped. Yeah, that's I don't know what the thoughts are. Alderman Clemens. Yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't go for that. No. Um, the only thing that I will say <clears throat> from my own, and I don't want to usurp what you're here for, but... The only thing I will say is that I, I, I've talked to a lot of the restaurant owners, 99% of, well, all of them that have participated this year are happy with, with it. Um, I would recommend for next year, however, that we keep the fees the way that they are at $500. And the reason that I say that is because this season is going to be cut short because of paving. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. So sometime in late, mid to late August, those um, barriers are going to come down. So we had anticipated when we put out the $500 that that $500 was going to carry them from May all the way to the middle of October. We are cutting them short because we have to um, pave Main Street. Now, most of the restaurants that I have talked to are okay with that, but feel that, you know, maybe the city can do something for them in, in, in the future. Meaning, and what I take from that is, okay, we won't raise the fees next year because we've, we sold you something and then midway through, and I was sitting at the finance committee meeting here, when it when the paving schedule came up and we had already been out um selling this to people and then all of a sudden it's oh well yeah we have to pave main street and we're going to take that back so my thought is that for next year 
we, we should probably try to keep those fees where they were this year, only for the fact that they didn't get a full year out of it, like, like we originally told them. I hear you and I support that. Um, one of my thoughts of trying to bring in lower fees for lower <coughs> grossing restaurants is maybe get more people to utilize the outdoor dining, like Joanne's Kitchen, for example, is not utilizing it this year, and they're a lower grossing uh, restaurant as compared to, um, you know, I don't want to use the flight center because I saw some articles about them recently, but like MT. Well, they, they don't use it, they don't do it yeah, anyway. But. Well, that might be, an, if it's free, based on their gross, or if they're in the negative, they could be another seat to turn over. But I, the paving thing, yes, leaving it in place for that year because we're cutting them short makes sense, but maybe, um, the following year, if we have lower grossing restaurants who want to take part of it to maybe increase their revenues, give it to them for free uh, based on their income or a smaller fee, maybe 250. I don't know. I, that, that's part of, I was trying to get more people in and make it more equitable, but the paving is definitely uh, a big barrier for, for them if we promise them one thing and then we're cutting it short. Uh -huh. Alderman Tebow. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree there with, with Alderman Clemens as far as this year. Um, I, I'm not even sure I'd go for that in the future. I, I, I guess I struggle with asking businesses to say, tell me what you gross. Um, I, I don't know, I just feel weird about doing that. I know we've talked about it before in this, in this situation. Um, you know, I was thinking what, what you guys were talking about. Joanne's Kitchen, do they open at night? No, but they have uh, lunch. Okay, so there's a couple places that don't do nighttime stuff. So, and they might utilize something like that. So the two or three places that do that, do you charge them something different because they don't get the night business? Which, like you say, I don't have to look at their books to know that a night dinner is much more expensive than a breakfast or a lunch. So do you charge those businesses that close by two o'clock or three o'clock, half of what you know, we're giving the, the other restaurants 250. Um, and again, now you're, you're trying to figure out who gets 250, who gets 500. Um, but it, to your point, it would open up those two places to, or three places to maybe say, okay, for 250, I'll do it. Now, if someone wanted to use their space at night, maybe they pay the other 250 and they're paying 750. I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm just throwing stuff out there because you know, you want more people to utilize. I know of at least one business that utilized it last year that decided not to utilize it this year because of the $500. So, and that's one of those type of businesses that don't have a nighttime service. So I was kind of thinking, you know, again, how could we get them? I don't really want to give it away because then you're like, other business would be like, are you giving it away for free? That's still a space that you're giving up, but we shouldn't give it for free. So, you know, I don't know. Again, I'm just throwing that out there to try to find an alternative way to, um, try to handle that. But for this year, I think we, I, I agree with leaving it to 500. Now, again, it still opens the, what do you do with the businesses that aren't utilizing it? I don't know. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to have the conversation early mm -hmm. because things like this, the paving come up. And when it comes, I hear the, the concern about having businesses self-certify their um, gross. But however, we do that for private citizens throughout the city, city welfares, for example. And I don't want to, be all social work, but someone went down and was escaping domestic violence and they said, no, you have too much money because you had to tell us how much money you have in order to get services. And they didn't get the services they wanted. What's the difference that we have this person seeking welfare services and we make them produce their bank statements and we can't ask the restaurant to self-certify a little box? I just equitable, equitable. Alderman Clemens. So my, 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 my issue with charging different things for different people, it has nothing to do with certifying, asking a restaurant to produce a, a profit and loss or with tax yeah. return, whatever. It has to do with the fact that every space on Main Street that we put a barrier in front of is a space that somebody can't park in and it's revenue lost. Mm -hmm. And the point that most of the public and some of the aldermen who were against some of this um, was, was that that revenue is being lost and how can we recuperate some of that? Not to say that, oh, we want to recuperate everything and we want, you know, but have skin in the game, be a partner with the city so that we can 
get some money <coughs> back and basically put that towards the cost of putting those barriers out, maintaining them, taking them back, you know, every year. And so the, the figure of $500 is what, you know, we, we came up with. And to me, a parking space is a parking space, kind of like going through a toll booth, right? Whether you have uh, a Maserati or you're driving my Ford uh, Fiesta, you, you're paying a dollar to go through the toll. We're not differentiating there between what it is that you're driving based in that and then that's what you're gonna pay, right? So, and I feel that this, it's the same way with the parking spaces when the barriers aren't there. You find a space, you pay what it costs to park there. With the space itself, if you're utilizing that for your restaurant, I feel the fee should be the same across the board for the same reason. I hear, so I that, hear. that's just kind of where, where I'm going with it. I completely understand where you are at as far as like, you know, it would be nice to be able to have it be equity, but I think in this particular thing, it is what it is. It's, it's, it's a space, it costs what it costs, and you either want to do that or you don't. Uh, I'm gonna get to all the, I'm just gonna throw this out here, it doesn't mean anyone has to answer. How do we get more people to join if they're smaller? Is there, hey, a pilot one year will give you a shot without cost, even though we're charging other restaurants this. That's what, how do we get more engagement? Because overall, it's a betterment to the city, the more people that are utilized in the space. All in the uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would recommend to this committee to probably look at what we did in infrastructure when we first, when this was in its infancy, when we brought it up, when we discussed barriers and everything. My only deep regret uh, being chairman of that committee is that we picked the concrete barriers. They, they were, at the particular time, uh, we had a high value on security, you know, and safety. And I think those have met the need and, and is still viable to this day. Are they attractive? Well, okay, you know. And then we tried painting them and the art critic amongst us, you know, complained about the artwork and, uh, you know, art is in the eyes of the beholder. You can't convince them all, you know what I mean? Some people say Mona Lisa isn't smiling, she's smiling, I don't know, but anyways. But to take a step back, there's one thing that the infrastructure committee did was get a hold of the stakeholders, and that is the restaurants, and have like a, a, a meeting, talk to Mary Lou Blaisdell, get people together and then come in and they can come in with this committee and find out what it is. I kind of like one flat rate across the board. You bring up a good point. I'm not against maybe first year granting to get somebody into directory, but in the case of Joanne's, that's a breakfast place. You know, they're not open that night, you know, so you want this. And then with the Yacht Center, we haven't seen the full compilation of what's gonna happen with the performing arts. I see the uh, occupancy of Main Street changing. You know, some great places that existed for years may not be here because they're not really, you know, I, I looked at the Performing Arts Center will be a generator of different type of things. I hate to see all restaurants downtown too, mm. you know, but, you know, we'll see where the course, natural progression of business kind of takes us. But it's, it appears, and, and, I, and I congratulate Alderman Clemens, because being on infrastructure, yeah, we are gonna pave Main Street. I am gonna fight tooth and nail. I am not putting a, a heavy concrete barrier on fresh laid tarmac, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. We'll have a permanent dip. Uh, but the thing is, so maybe we do have the time. But there's other benefits that came out of this that really nobody saw on the horizon. Because of the lack of brakes in the system, people are actually using the crosswalks. Because they're not like, you know, hey, my days of jumping over concrete barriers are over too. You know what I mean? So I choose, I'll walk a couple extra feet to take the crosswalk. We brought Main Street down from four lanes to two lanes. Uh, once we solved the problems around the peddler's daughter and stopped the impediment, of the traffic flow going down Canal Street. 
I think we've greatly, you know, increased the flow of traffic and we slowed it down. And that's kind of what we want. I mean, if you look, if you're sitting out there nighttime dining, you know, I remember some alderman were, come, you know, wondering, will people be stealing French fries while they're riding down motorcycles all over the barriers? Thank God that hasn't happened, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was a legitimate concern. But, you know, in looking at it, there's been a lot of great things that came out of it too. That doesn't really have a dollar amount to it, you know, so you gotta weigh the, you know, the balance with that equally as well. So I would suggest Again, going back to a meeting with the stakeholders, I'm all in favor of charging what the market, what they feel, what is the marketable price and how much that's worth to them. And then come out with across the board. And keep it in mind of a places like the Joanne that may not be, you know, like I say, a high impact or something like that. But it's enough to go, I, I think, around, and it seems like we have the time to do it, so thank you. And I'm hoping that at the end of this meeting that we give direction uh, to Director Hannum to say, go to the Downtown Improvement Committee and find out these uh, facts for us and bring it back so we don't make decisions in a vacuum. So hmm. thank you, Alderman. Oh, thank you. No, I think that's great. <laughs> Alderman Tito. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so, you know, we, we did, at one, obviously we went to them last year, and I think what we, what we found out is the 500 was kind of a compromise, because I think there were some people out there that, I don't want to pay more than 300. Um, we had one alderman, I think it was Alderman Jetty, because I think he was quoting Portsmouth and some of the other towns that have a different, you know, Portsmouth is a destination. Nashville's not yet a destination. We, you know, obviously we'd love to make it one. It's usually a drive-through to get to Manchester, Concord, or anything, or, and, uh, Portsmouth is. So you can pay $1,000 for a parking space um, over in Portsmouth. But we know the temperature here is the businesses would not pay $1,000. And we, you know, we went back and forth. I mean, these meetings, we were, we were going back and forth. I think uh, Tim had come and thought he had talked to some businesses and some of the aldermen have talked to some businesses. And some people were like, well, if it's going to be $700, i am not going to do it. And we were thinking 250, 300, that's too low. And so I think 500 kind of took into account those businesses that make a ton of money to the ones that are lower. And most of them, I think most of them actually signed on to it. I think there's a couple that didn't. Um, we believe the, the performing hour of the National Center for the Arts is going to increase traffic. I've talked to people that have gone to shows and if you don't get a reservation, you're not getting into a restaurant. Um, you know, even last weekend, we had two shows, I believe, of Menopause the Musical. Um, and uh, from what I was told is the restaurants were packed. So, um, and so we know people are going to these restaurants and using it. Now, is that generating so much, you know, extra income that we're like, we can bump it to 600, we can bump it to 650. Obviously those people that weren't gonna pay 500 probably still aren't gonna pay 500 because if they're places like uh, Joanne's or, um, Jaja Bells that kind of open during the day, but they're not getting that generation of extra money that the restaurants at night are getting because, you know, five o'clock or an eight o'clock show, they're not open on the weekends or even during the week. So I don't know. I mean, it's, it's tricky. I mean, you want to keep involvement because it's good to have that involvement involvement. You want them to generate money because that only helps us, um, as a city. So, I don't know. I mean, I know we're going to have some people come in here and go, let's charge them $5,000 of space or, or whatever ridiculous stuff, you know? Um, so we have to find some kind of compromise where we know we'll still get people using the spots, but still generating at least some of the revenue. People want to get every single dollar and every single nickel back that we're giving up and giving out these spaces. That's just not reasonable or it's just not, um, you know, rational. It's not what's going to happen. So, but we got to get as much as we can without making the businesses not want to do it. So what is that middle ground? 500 this year was that middle ground. Maybe it is next year with the paving, but beyond that, where are we going? Right? I don't know. Yeah. And, and I agree that, you know, trying to recoup all the costs that we have lost in revenue is not, that's not part of a public part, uh, private partnership. You're looking to find that middle ground in order to and get more um, uh, activity downtown by paying, call, charging reasonable fees. Um, my thought process is 
we get more people in if we can, and it, whether we, the current people stay at five and you say to smaller, oh, do you want to give us a shot? Here's another 250. Uh, to pay 250, you can have t a spot. And I, I was at breakfast with my daughter last Sunday at Joanne's, and I think to myself, if there's space there, right next to the um, farmer's market, people are gonna walk down, see that the breakfast is open, they're gonna enjoy breakfast, and then, or go down to the farmer's market right after on a Sunday. It's just part of like human behavior. If you see people out there eating, they're gonna be like, I'm gonna stop at this place, it looks good. And that visual of people outside eating, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, has to migrate uh, to the, where the activity is. Thank you. I, um, it's going to be a question to you, actually. So those places that don't currently have spaces, do they use any of the outside sidewalk? Like, do they currently use do outside dining? Some of them do, yes. Like okay. um, uh, the Greek place. Um, Main Street. Main Street. Main Street, yes, yeah. 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 Uh, and that's all, you know, those are the kind of businesses I'm thinking of because they are owned by Seven Star. But they are using the... They're using the street um, dining there. Okay. Um, so my thought is... How do we get more people involved, <coughs> utilize space as needed, maybe charge them a smaller fee? And you know, I, clearly here there's no um, uh, flavor for raising the fee for higher earning um, uh, restaurants. Again, I'm a social worker, so equability is like driven into my brain. Uh, but um, we can always discuss that after next year when the paving is not going to impact. Um, Elderman Clemens. Yeah, and I and and I and I agree. I would agree with your last comment there that I think next year, I think around this time, I think definitely would be fair to <clears throat> start talking about what are we going to raise it to. Mm -hmm. I just think that where that curveball was thrown, um, and and kind of hit right at like the worst time you could do it while you're trying to get people to sign contracts for this year. Mm -hmm. I think I think what I think we need to just keep it where where it's at, out of fairness. Yeah. Um, but I think this discussion next year, as far as raising it, absolutely. Okay. And I thought that last year, you know, before the we knew that oh they're going to come and in and, and pave Main Street um, mm -hmm. like that, right? Because originally they were going to pave Main Street in the in the spring, and it wasn't going to be impacted. Mm -hmm. And then when that didn't, ha it was like no, you can't because if you put the barrier down, it needs five or six months to cure and all this stuff. So that's actually why they moved it. It's not that we didn't know Main Street was gonna get paved. It was that we thought it was gonna get paved in the spring before barriers went down, but you can't do that because they would have, it would have set basically an indentation where all, where all those barriers were. So um, as far as the equitability, I think we should think, we should disc think more about that. Um, for next year for 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 that I don't know that there's a solution there that that I would necessarily support but I certainly believe that uh, it's a fair it's a fair discussion I think I think the other fair discussion or the other fair thing to do would be to go to those businesses and say if it was two hundred and fifty dollars would you do it because if the answer is no then there's no point in doing that at all right there's no point in even going down that road because if and we know who what businesses they are so we can have that conversation like a hypothetical so i i would say that that's where we should start great with with that did you have a uh, if i could <laughs> I just mr chair just i would like to make it just a brief comment and i i won't say a word the rest of the night but um <laughs> or maybe i can't keep to that but uh, a few things i just want to maybe call out so i think um you know, we're not through the season yet. And the reason I want to bring that up is not only do we not have a full picture of, of the data, if you will, of utilization, um, but I can say that I have had some one-on-one -on -one conversations with businesses, and I, I expect a director Hannum has as well, that are, are just not sure where they stand on this just yet. And so I think it's, it's incumbent upon, uh, you know, city staff to be, to have an opportunity to go <coughs> directly engage with them and get real, albeit somewhat anecdotal, but real data about why they're choosing not to use the spaces. Because I think we're, we're even on our end, we're assuming that it's cost related, but it may in fact be more complicated than that for them. Um, where they may, uh, 
you know, they may be sharing space with another entity or there are other factors that are driving their decision making. And I guess the toughest part for me to say is that some businesses have approached us to say, you know, I would do it, but it's really, really hard for me. What do you want me to do? And, and they, they want to have this active conversation with the city. And of course, our, our primary response is, you know, we want you to do this, but in some cases there are mitigating circumstances. And so I think it's important to have a clear picture of what those circumstances might be and then bring that information back to you in a, an anonymous form, if you will, to have a discussion. <laughs> But I think there are other factors than cost. I guess I would just say that to start. The last thing I just want to say is that I, I do want to keep the end in mind to some extent here. You know, we are actively working right now, and we'll be bringing this forward soon. We are actively working on a Main Street conceptual redesign that will take a lot of this, uh, I'll call it tactical urbanism, although tactical urbanism mm -hmm. doesn't usually extend for multiple years, but this tactical urbanism or piloting that we're doing and bring it forward in a more permanent form. And so, um, you know, we'll definitely need to have a, a solution for the fees for the next year, I would say, because it's going to be a long time before we're able to move the construction forward. But, you know, there will be a longer term solution. And even in the conversations that we've had with businesses, we've been saying to them, we understand it's challenging for you. We understand that maybe the customer base is not what it is today, but help us understand as a community what having this more vibrant downtown space would be for your business. And when we say that, some businesses actually say, okay, all right, I'd like to be a part of that conversation. May not want to write $500 checks just yet, but I see where you're going with this, and therefore maybe I am a little bit more supportive in, in writing that check, if not this year, maybe the next year. Um, so it's, we've, I've had some conversations with business, I expect that's what Director Hannum's gonna say in a few minutes, but they're, they're, they're open to talking about this more, even the ones that have not put anything out just yet. Can we let Director Hammond <laughs> Can I just go into it? Because I was going to ask for her opinion as well. Go ahead. Um, because she's been patiently waiting. Um, I agree with waiting long. I think waiting longer does give us more data. I think that's important. Um, but before, I just wanted to say one thing. Alderman Jetty had said this, and, and I guess I don't understand it either. I kind of agree with him. $500 seems like pretty cheap when you generate so much money just in one sitting. So. I don't know, I'm not in the restaurant business, I've never worked in the restaurant restaurant business, so I don't know where that um, kind of, it seems cheap if you're making a lot of money, um, but I could be wrong on that. But my last thing was I did wanna hear if she had had any, the director had any experience in her former uh, job with this or in the past and uh, what her thoughts are too, right through you. <laughs> Thank you for being so patient. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, Liz Hannum, Economic Development. Um, yes, so I've had a lot of experience with these, um, both in communities pre-COVID and during COVID, um, and they, they do bring a lot of vibrancy to the community. The businesses that I have spoken to in downtown right now, um, not to add complexity, but once you add retail to this, this scenario as well, um, there's, they, they are not seeing any benefit to, to the, the barriers. However, to, to your equity point, we could potentially incentivize the lunchtime if you know you have two meals. We can incentivize, say, you know, we'll give you two fifty back at the end of the season if you're if you've done something to help the retail businesses along the way or things like that. Um, that we can help both re, uh, retail and restaurant um, move forward. But the, the communities that I've worked in before um, have all been very hesitant um, to, to put parklets or barriers out. Um, however, they've all been beautiful and they work really well. They bring communities, um, communities out. Um, I, I would say we do have a, a aesthetics problem with the, the concrete barrier, um, but th there might be a, a, a way to fix that in the future. Um, maybe not with artwork, but, <laughs> um, but with something else. Um, but I do think um, that, that having that fee in place is important because um, it, whether it's to start out with and then they get kind of reimbursed as they do things that, that support the rest of the community, um, but the skin in the game portion is really important um, for the businesses as we, we don't wanna do things for the businesses, we wanna do things with the businesses. 
Um, and so that, that would be my, my response to the, the conversation around um, fee schedules and things like that. Um, Alderman Tebow. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, question to the director through you. For sure. um, so the real retail businesses, that's, that's one thing that I thought a lot about um, as we were doing this, because yeah. I have a constituent that owns a business there, and we know very well that the, the people who have retail businesses came pretty strongly, not all of them, but some did. Um, one supported us and now is out of business. So, it, it, you know, it not, not barrier related, but at the end of the day, it is tougher for the retail businesses. But aren't most, a lot of those retail businesses like eight to five, eight to four, and so they're not, when they say they're not getting the benefit of it, the benefit really starts, if you want traffic through your stores, you, you know, you go to Boston, you go to like, you know, Porter Square or something, everything's open during the time the restaurants are to a certain extent, right? Not past, you know, midnight or anything, but they're, they're open when people are there and that's not happening. So they may get some lunch crowd, but you know, they're not going to get the dinner crowd if they're not open. And it, some might not even be open on weekends. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that kind of hurts them. And I guess that's not their business model. Um, you know, they open during the day and that's what they want to do. But if we had businesses open at night, wouldn't we get that traffic? Or am I just overthinking this? Um, Director? It, yes, I, I am agree. Um, however, the, a lot of the businesses are one man shop kind of things. And so um, it, it is a, a capacity issue for a lot of them. Um, I know that the, the downtown association, um, Great American Downtown, is going to do a ladies' night shopping where they all stay open late. Um, I think there's also a perception issue that, that they won't get the business if they stay open later. Um, so we have to kind of show them that that, that is a possibility. And th those kind of ladies' nights, one, you know, first Fridays kind of projects, um, I think could be really beneficial in kind of proving the concept to them um, and maybe shifting their hours um, to the capacity. Um, I'm also hoping to work with um, the National Regional Planning Council um, to use their data on pedestrian counts um, to help them make kind of real-time decisions on, on what their staffing looks like and um, prove to them that, that maybe if they stay open two hours later, you know, open later, stay later, um, that that there there is a possibility that they could catch some of that n um, nighttime lunch or dinner crowd, um, and I think post COVID, a lot of the restaurants have decided not to reopen for lunch and only for dinner, and so I think they were they they could have seen the benefit pre COVID, um, mm -hmm. but are, are not seeing that as as much during that lunchtime crowd, but it is. Um, it does feel like a lot of the businesses are kind of, um, or the retail businesses are, are owned by people who have recently retired and are doing this as a second career. So it's kind of, they're figuring it out. Um, but I think the, the more career style businesses will, will eventually um, see some of that data and make their own decisions um, based on that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, that's what I was thinking too. I was like, you know, why don't you take a Thursday, Friday, Saturday or something and shift your day so you know you're, you're sleeping in a little bit but yeah you know, you're getting the benefit of that and if it doesn't work you move back or whatever i mean the problem is is the advertising right you gotta people gotta have to know that those businesses are open at those times um because you know people who want to go there might not go there now if there's walking traffic and they see it's open they're going to go in mm -hmm. um i mean you can't you know obviously can't force people to give the hours of their business you know what right. we want them to be it's got to be what they want, but you know, I would I look at it and I go, man, they would certainly benefit from being open when the packs open, you know, at night when it's a lot of people going up and down. Because I look for things if I go to cities and I'm at a show or something and it's ten o'clock and there's nothing to do or nine o'clock, I'm walking around going, can we go in here? Can we have a drink here? Can we? What's this? A bookstore? Like I'm going in and seeing stuff. So, um, you know, that's the kind of vibrancy we want in Nashville. We don't want like the pack ends at ten o'clock and everything's closed, you know, on a Friday night. You know, you want the the vibrancy. So, um, I, yeah, I hope that stuff works and I hope um, people are able to see that, it, you know, sometimes the, the benefit may not be there, but you gotta go to the benefit. You know, you gotta go where the benefit is yeah. to, to reap that. And if, if they're doing okay without it, then that's fine, but then they're gonna come to us and say the, you know, the barriers aren't helping them. So that's, that's a hard thing. I, we, there were some people that had a hard, no, I don't want them there. They just get in my way. We did give some parking spaces back to a couple businesses to, 
kind of help them out in Upper Berry in front of their, their business. But it would be good if we could generate more interest there. It's always been a frustration of mine that feels at a certain hour downtown, especially on Friday and Saturday nights, that it's just, I'm just still a relatively young person and going out, you know, I want to go to downtown Nashua. I don't want to go to Boston. I'm in that age group <laughs> where I still want to be in a lively area. Um, but then still so many places close at like 9, 30, 10. So you get stuck with, uh, well, not stuck with, they're actually really good. I love peddlers, Mike, you were there. Uh, and uh, Casey McGee's, it's really uh, fun. But then you get like, uh, some restaurants aren't even open on Sunday. After the Memorial Day parade, uh, my wife and I went down to grab lunch. We thought we'd go to Oddfellows Close, and that was a uh, holiday it was a Monday. weekend. It was yeah. A Monday, yeah. yeah, that Monday, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's just trying to incentivize, but um, Alderman Clemens. Yeah, so that 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 retail, um, the the environment or retail, the the restaurant uh, environment where <clears throat> in Nashua where things are closed on Monday and Tuesday and some even Wednesday, it is in large part due to the fact that we don't have uh, we don't have people coming to downtown during the week during the day. You know, most of the people that live in Nashua work outside of Nashua. So we're leaving the city to, to go to work and, and stuff like that. And compounding that problem is, I don't know if you saw today, or it, um, the unemployment rate in, Nashua, or in New Hampshire is 1.9%. So there's nobody out there. You have tons of positions to fill. Some of these places would like to be open on Monday or Tuesday, but they can't because they can't find anybody to work. And there is, it's not like this perception of, you know, nobody wants to work is annoying to me because it's like the unemployment rate has never been lower in this state, never. So the fact that like, you know, people say, oh, well, people don't want to work. Well, maybe the 2% of the people that are there, but I, that, I, I doubt it. You know, there's other factors there. So, um, it just, we we are in an economy that is very unusual right now where, you know, uh, and we're going to see it change because I, I, I can tell you I'm in the lending market right now and we've slowed down tremendously compared to where we were last year. So the, the economy is definitely cooling off. I don't know how, much, how long that unemployment rate is going to stay low. Um, so I think we're I think we're in for turbulent times in, ahead. But I think, you know, right now, as things stand, we're 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 in good shape. But I don't see I don't see that changing. You know, the small businesses being closed on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday in Nashua. I don't see that changing in the future. I, if anything, I see more of them going going that way, um, which is unfortunate. Um, oh. Director, yep. Yeah, um, I think I think we can work on some incremental approaches to this this problem. Um, you know, whether it's just the nights that the pack is open that that we kind of work with the businesses to try to stay open and, and take advantage of, or it's just Friday nights. Um, so we can work on an incremental approach to try and get them to a place where where they could potentially you know pick up one extra day or a lunchtime shift. Um, so I, I feel like um, if we're working towards something, that incremental approach is going to be really important. So I think um, if we could, uh, if we could ask, um, do we even need to make a motion on it? No, right. Uh, if we could ask you to um, take the discussion that we had here, uh, connect with the Downtown Improvement Committee, maybe Great American Downtown, other restaurants directly, especially those that aren't utilizing the service yep. and retailers to see how equitability uh, conversation that we had can be impactful to their businesses, um, how they're doing right now uh, regarding outdoor dining, how it's, if it's impactful or not, okay. and uh, just the general conversation what we, what we had. And <coughs> yeah. We'll come back and question, question about. to readdress. Yes. So thank you. Um, so do we need um, a piece of legislation to keep it at 500 next year? Not obviously we're not going to create it tonight, but yes, 
because that's where that's kind of what we've talked about for next year, right? Because oh, it needs of the to paving, renew, right? Because yeah, it's one year, I think, right? Yeah, yeah we were going to revisit it. So at some point this year, we're going to need legislation, and I guess the economic development director would go to legal and have that created for us to then come back here and obviously debate that and then go eventually go to the Board of Aldermen. I don't know what time we need that by, but we definitely want to make sure we, we're not as late to the game as we were last year. We, we, I mean, I, ideally we would want to have that drafted before, like by, by December. We, well, okay. I mean, not drafted, we would want it passed by December at the very, very latest. Um, but I would think that we would want to get this data first before we draft legislation so that we can have a discussion about what people are saying, then draft the legislation and debate it. But if I have my druthers, it's going to be $500 just the way it was this year for one year again, and then move it forward. But John, Alderman Tebow. Thank you. I think we probably should get it, um, start debating it probably in September at least. Um, and the only reason I say that is because um, if for some reason it, it gets pushed out and pushed out and we, we have a new board starting January, uh, that could you know completely change what we, I'd like to put that in place, make sure it gets in place by the end of December so that way we don't have that issue. I did just say September. Oh, you did? <laughs> well, I'm with you then. Yeah, yeah, I'm I think September, I, I think September is good to have, to, either August or September is good to have this follow-up discussion and then create and then create the legislation okay. after that. But I don't think we should put the cart before the horse in this in this case. Gotcha. I agree. Do you agree with that, Director? I do. All right. Yes. Any further discussion? All right. Well, thank you both. I know Director Sullivan still chimed in, even though it's not his department, and I appreciate it. <laughs> um, table and committee. There is none. General discussion. None. Uh, public comment. There's none. Or remarks by Alderman. No. Uh, Alderman Thibault, is there a motion? Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, make a motion to adjourn. Great. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, we are adjourned at 8.17 p.m. Oh, usually they have.